right, well, good morning once again. Sure good to see you all here. No better place to be on a Sunday morning, I think. Very good. Thank you so much, worship team, for your faithfulness week by week, for coming out and uh, helping us, helping to soften our hearts and get prepared to hear God's heart on the matter. We need to be prepared. We don't just presume into the presence of God. We don't just flip open the Bible willy-nilly. We want to... Uh, we want to treat God and his word with the proper reverence, hey? This is a unique book. There's no other book like this one. This one comes from the spirit of God himself. Um, this morning, you know, while I was uh, welcoming you all here and while we were just getting started, I mentioned that we're here to reflect upon the greatest message the world's ever heard, the gospel. Paul said the gospel is the message that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, Demonst that was demonstrated in the sinless life of Christ and his death and resurrection, you know, and in the things he taught and in the miracles he performed. It's there, that message there in, in that man's life, in, in his words. But who is Jesus? Well, he's the... He's an Israelite. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He still has that identification. In the future, he'll still be a Jewish person. You know that? Who are the Israelites? Oh, that's that nation that came out of Egypt, right? Led by Moses through the wilderness, came through the Red Sea. That's Israel. Oh, how did they end up in Egypt? How did they end up in bondage for 400 years? Oh, we're reading about that now. You remember one of the sons of Jacob, was sold into slavery and sold into Egypt. And while he was in Egypt, this young man, Joseph, 13 years away from home, and some of those years spent in, a, in an Egyptian jail. That young man, through the providence of God, we read about it last week, he, he rose to second in command over all of Egypt. The only one above him was Pharaoh. Pharaoh entrusted everything to Joseph. And we're reading about, about uh, Joseph now. Remember, a famine is about to hit. And Joseph knew what to do. God gave him a premonition. Actually, he gave the premonition to the Pharaoh, who didn't know what to do with it. But God gave Joseph supernatural wisdom. Here's what the premonition means. A famine coming. Get ready. Here's what you do. And so Joseph now, elevated to second in command, in uh, all of, over all of Egypt. And we learn something there about the providence of God, don't we? Uh, Joseph's circumstances for a time, actually for a long time, didn't look too hopeful. It looked like all hope was lost, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, if you were in Joseph's situation, I'm sure there have been times when you would have thought, God, what are you doing? Where are you? And yet God had everything under control. Uh, God is uh, seldom early and never late, and he knows what he's doing. And we see the providence of God at work here, and, and Joseph gets elevated. And so basically what's happening, Joseph now is in charge of distributing food to people. And so people all over the world are coming to Egypt for help, and they've got to go through Joseph. So we're in chapter 42 now. And guess who, or Genesis 42, guess who is feeling the effects of the famine Guess who is really feeling it now and really starting to panic? Where are we going to get food to eat? Jacob. That's Joseph's own father there in the land of Canaan and his 11 brothers. They're feeling it now. Look at this now. Genesis 42. And when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, Why do ye look one upon another? <laughs> I love it. Why are you sitting there looking at each other? Why are we staring at each other? Let's get something done here uh, to save our lives. There's food in Egypt. Let's go down to Egypt. Now, as an aside, can you guess why, these, why are these men uh, just staring at each other and not wanting to go to Egypt? Everyone and their dog knows Egypt's where you go to get food. Why are they hesitant? I think they're afraid they might bump into Joseph. And Joseph's going to spill the beans, and uh, Dad's going to learn all about it, what these men did to their brother. I mean, they were bent on killing him at first. Remember that? 
And Reuben stepped in and said, let's not kill him, come on. And they ended up selling him into Egypt. Well, these men are just kind of staring at each other, but uh, they're going to go. They're going to have to take the risk and go down to, uh, to Egypt. Look at verse 5. And the sons of Israel, that's Jacob, his name is also Israel. The sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came. Uh, came to buy corn among those that came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan, and Joseph was the governor over, over the land. And he it was that sold to all the people of the land, and Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Where have we read that before? Anyone remember? Joseph had a dream. Young man, 17 years old, he has a premonition, a dream uh, given to him by God. And guess what? In the dream is depicted this exact thing. Your brothers, Joseph, they're going to come and bow down themselves to the earth in front of you. Joseph had two dreams that signified this, and here it is. I mean, that, that's a pretty amazing thing, isn't it? You're going to be elevated. In God's economy, you're going to be elevated to a place of very high honor. You're going to be given great responsibility. You're going to save people alive, Joseph. And your, brother, your brothers are going to reflect this in their obeisance that they're going to perform to you. They're going to, go to the, they're going to bow their faces to the ground. Now, that's a wonderful truth, but look what Joseph had to pass through. That seems to be a message in the scriptures, too, you know. Uh, no crown without a cross. I like, I like Gil's uh, saying there, no testimony without a test. And Joseph, there's going to be no obeisance to you without this prison experience, without this dark time. You know, Jesus said it, friends, I mean, this morning we're going to talk about it. What a fantastic promotion you're going to get one day as a Christian. The crown you're going to wear, the authority you're going to have. We're going to judge angels one day. What's that going to look like? But right now, you've been called by Christ to bear your cross. You're going to bear some suffering. It is through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom of God. Yes, we're going to, we're going to receive a, a promotion like Joseph, but we're going to go through some hard times. Sorry, I have to tell you that. But it's going to be worth it. It's like a, a video I watched recently. Maybe you've seen this video of this lady on her way to the hospital. She's in hard labor. Do you see that? Who's seen this video recently? I guess it's just us, dear. <laughs> It's not graphic, you don't see anything obscene, but uh, you get what's happening. This woman is sitting in the passenger seat, there's a camera on her, and the husband's driving the car, rush to the hospital, and she can feel the baby coming, and what do you know, out comes the baby. While they're on the road, and she holds up a baby. It's a boy. And, but there's a couple moments there where she is screaming, and I could feel the hair on the back of my neck going up, because it's just so horrific, you know, you just feel the woman's pain. And uh, as soon as that baby's born, she's holding this little boy, and her pain is gone, and it's forgotten, just like that. She's thrilled she has a baby boy. And doesn't the Lord Jesus use that exact analogy? You forget the pain, because a, a, new, a new young man has come into the world. And that's kind of like Joseph here, you know? He passed through a pretty dark time, but look at the promotion he gets, and look at the high honors he receives. That's a message for us Christians. You're going to face some hard times walking through this life. Sometimes you'll face hard times at the hands of other people who hate the Lord. And in North America, believe me, that is coming uh, in full strength. We're going to feel it. We are. Uh, and yet it's temporary. It's finite. Please look ahead. The Bible is given to us in part for, to help us look ahead to the amazing future that God has prepared for those that love him. Okay? Verse 7. Joseph saw his brethren and he knew them. But he made himself strange to them, and he spake roughly to them. And they said, uh, he said unto them, Whence come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. Okay, now that's a pretty important uh, truth there that we're reading. We can understand why they don't recognize him. Okay, these are rough, tough, dirty shepherds coming bearded. They don't look like the richest people on earth. They look like they've been working for a living. And they come walking into Egypt, looking like that, and there's Joseph, he's clean-shaven, he's got paint on his face, he looks like an Egyptian. And he's speaking Egyptian to them fluently. He needs an interpreter, we'll read about that. So they don't have a clue who they're talking to. All they know is there's, a, there's a, a bigwig up there in Egypt, a man of high honors that we need to treat with respect. 
but Joseph knows exactly who they are. And this reminds us of the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? In John chapter 2, it tells us that Jesus didn't need anybody to testify to him about men. He knew what was in man. You remember that right at the end of John 2? But to see, Christ's own brethren didn't believe in him. They didn't know who he really, really was. It says, John chapter 7, verse 5, neither did his brethren believe him. They were kind of mocking him, as a matter of fact. And we see a little Bible truth there reflected in the life of Joseph, don't we? It says in verse 9, And Joseph remembered the dreams that he dreamed of them, and he said to them, You are spies. But now Joseph's going to have a little fun with them. Huh. I'm not, I have to confess to you, I really don't understand all of what's motivating Joseph. I think he wants to reveal himself to them. He wants to have a connection with them. He doesn't want them to just take the corn and head back to Canaan. He wants relationship again with them. Uh, but uh, he's got some kind of plan in his mind that I really don't understand. But he, here we have a false accusation, and Joseph knows it's false, right? You're spies. Verse 10, it says here, they say to him, Nay, Lord, but to buy food are thy servants come. And then they start giving Joseph all kinds. They say they panic now. And they start giving this Egyptian, they think he's just an Egyptian, they start giving him all kinds of information. We are, this, uh, we are one man's sons. We are true men. Uh, in other words, we're telling the truth. We're, we're, we don't lie. We're not lying to you. you know, be, be kind to us. You know, don't harm us here. We're not lying. Uh, it says in verse 13, they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. And so in other words, uh, the, okay, the young one, Benjamin, he's still there in Canaan with our dad, and one of our brethren, he's gone. Right? And they're talking to the actual guy. You're actually the one that's gone. And they have no idea who they're talking to. Joseph said to them, uh, That is it that I spake unto you, saying, You are spies. Hereby shall ye be proved. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come here. Come thither. So the, he's going to have a he's going to have a little plan here. Okay, I'm going to figure out if you're spies or not. We're going to put you all in prison, and one of you is going to go back to Canaan, and you're going to bring that youngest brother that you talked to me about. You're going to bring him back now, and then I'll know that you're not spies. So he's going to put them in custody. It says uh, in verse 17, three days you guys are in custody, and he brings them out of custody, and he says, okay, well, a, a slight modification to my plan. You can all go back and get your youngest brother except one. We're going to keep one of you. And that is going to be Simeon, you're going to find out. Now look at verse 21. We're going to see some real repentance. I think this is godly sorrow here. I think, I think these men have evolved over time. I think that they have grown uh, spiritually. I think they've matured somewhat since they've uh, mishandled their brother, Joseph. Look at this, verse 21. And they said one to another, We are very guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us, and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. Remember before they threw Joseph into that cistern that didn't have water in it? They threw him down there, and I said, Well, I'm sure he's not just quiet down there. He must have been pleading with them. And here our suspicions are confirmed. He was. And these guys showed absolute apathy for their brother. In fact, they sat down and had lunch while he was pleading for their mercy. Oh, of course, now we have the oldest, Reuben, showing up to say what? Basically, I told you so. Look at now, please, verse 22. Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not to you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear? Therefore, behold, this, his blood is required. I told you this was a bad idea. Now we're really going to get it. Now we're suffering. But uh, I think what we're getting from these brothers is a real confession here. They said, one, one to another, not knowing that Joseph is standing there, not knowing he can even understand. I mean, the very next verse says, verse 23, uh, Joseph understood, but they didn't know that. They're, they're using an interpreter. There's a translator on the scene here. And so these men are confessing one to another. We are very guilty. We would not hear. And I think, I, I just want to say something as an aside here, if I could. And, and now we get into a little theology here, but uh, mankind can hear the voice of God. I'm convinced of it. We read Romans chapter 1, general revelation. 
Romans chapter 2, we've got God's internal witness in our heart of hearts. The Bible tells us in John 1, 9 that Jesus Christ is the true light that lightens every man coming into the world. That means everybody. Everybody is aware of God's presence. Everybody knows that God is real, that he exists, that he makes moral demands on our lives. The problem is we will not hear. That's the issue. It's not that you can't. By the way, I don't think you could, anybody, anywhere, ever, if God didn't enable you to. Christ is the true light that enlightens every man. Okay, that's why the Bible says, Romans chapter 1, verse 20, you are without excuse when you deny and suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Truth of God. That's the, that, you're not going to say to God when you stand before his solemn judgment seat, no one's going to say, well, I didn't know. Uh, no one told me. I didn't know. Uh, I had no idea that there wasn't such a person as you, God. God will say, oh, no, you don't. You knew perfectly well. As a matter of fact, that is going to be the problem. God is going to sit down with people, and we're going to talk about what you knew to be true, and you denied and suppressed. The, the, the truth that God did confront you with, and you knew it was true, and you said, I didn't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I want intellectual and moral autonomy. I'll live my life the way I want to. Thank you. That doesn't go on forever. Okay, and I think we have the strongest intuition, don't we? That you're guilty of the things you heard and understood and just pushed away. You're guilty not because you couldn't hear, but because you wouldn't hear. That's the issue. These men are recognizing it, and they're correct. We are very guilty because we would not hear, okay? You go to the great prophets of the Old Testament, the great ones, the major prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. And that's the indictment they have for God's people. You would not hear. You remember Isaiah chapter 5, where Isaiah says, Israel, you're my vineyard. And I did everything for my vineyard. And I came looking for grapes. And why is it that I got wild grapes? I got stinky, rotten fruit from you. Why? What? And then God asks the question, what more could I have done for my vineyard? What more could I have done? I gave you everything. I did everything I could do. He is expecting a negative answer there in Isaiah 5. And that's one of the reasons, uh, friends, why I'm just not a five-point Calvinist. I just don't see it there. I don't see that God just sort of arbitrarily regenerates people and kind of just zaps you, and there now, now you believe. Now you can recognize truth. No, I don't see that. Otherwise, God could have just gave irresistible grace. I mean, he says, what more could I have done? Well, you could have gave irresistible grace, but he didn't. I mean... Are you, I hope you're seeing that. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? God is fair to the human race. He is fair to humanity. He gives you everything you need to respond affirmatively to the truth he's confronting you with. And the sad fact is most people on this earth just won't respond affirmatively to his truth. We want our own lives. We want to make our own choices. We'll make our own values, value judgments, moral judgments. Thank you very much. And... Um, well, God says, you'll be called to account for that. Anyway, we see it here. We have that intuition, and these men had it, and they're correct. They would not hear. It isn't that they couldn't hear Joseph down there in the well. They, they just wouldn't. Okay, verse uh, 24 now. Look what, look what happens here. And he turned himself about from them, and he wept. This is Joseph now. Joseph seeing his brothers, they're in agony here. We're guilty. We're, we're going to get punished for this. Uh, they are, this is not comforting. They're, they're tormented. And Joseph has a soft heart to this very hour. Can we, how, how do you go through the things Joseph has gone through and you have your heart still soft for those that meant to do you harm? How do you do that? We're going to find out later. Joseph has the things of God in his mind. Joseph's going to tell his brothers later on, you meant to do me evil, but you know what? God had that whole thing in mind to do good to the world. God orchestrated all this to do good, to save people alive through the famine. I needed to be in Egypt. And you, you know, you, you were, your motives were bad, but God used those things to make a greater good come about. That's how Joseph's getting through this. That's how his heart is staying soft. He's got the plans and purposes of God in his mind and in his heart. That's how Jesus Christ the Lord could allow himself to be nailed to a tree, and, and then guess what? He could offer prayers for those that were murdering him. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. 
Oh, that the church of God would have hearts like that. We'd have, we'd have soft hearts for people. You're, I'll confess to you, your pastor today does not always have the softest heart for people. How are you doing? Would you pray for your murderers? It's very difficult, isn't it? But Joseph is a spectacular object lesson. A spectacular foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, whose heart was always, and his mind always, stayed on the things of God. That's how he gets through. That's how he has a right attitude through all the darkness that he endured. Okay, so Joseph, he said, we're going to keep one of you behind. I'm going to keep Simeon behind. You guys, you go back. Here's some, here's some food. You go back to Canaan, and you get that younger brother of yours, and uh, I'm keeping Simeon. Uh, but look at verse 28. Uh, what happened? Well, along the way, they open up their sacks of uh, grain, and guess what? The money that they had intended to give to Joseph, to the Egyptians, in exchange for the food, it's there in their sacks. And now they're really worried. Oh, no. Uh, the Egyptians are going to think we ripped them off. We still have our money. This man, this guy was hostile to us, and we didn't do anything to him. Now he's got a reason. We're in danger. Look at verse 28. Uh, it says here, verse 27, as one of them opened his sack to give his ass provender in the inn, he espied his money, for behold, it was in the sack's mouth. And he said to his brethren, my money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack. And their heart failed them, and they were afraid, saying one to, to the other, what is this that God has done to us? Well, what do we make of that? At least these men are thinking that God runs this world. They don't see the world as random, accidental, and mean. I mean, whatever, whatever other imperfections we see in these men, at least this much, the world is not random and accidental and meaningless to them. There's a God running this place who brings the guilty to justice. Right? Thou shalt not get away with it, is kind of in their minds here. What is this that God has done with us? They're afraid. You know, 1 John uh, chapter 4, I think in verse 18, somewhere there, it says that fear hath torment. We're afraid when we think we're about to come under the judgment for some moral failing. Absolutely, yes. And, and these men are afraid now. Very afraid. They're going to head back to Canaan, and they bring the food back to their dad. And it looks like, as you read it, they have no intentions of going back to Egypt. Now, okay, and we have a problem here, because Simeon is still there in custody. And these men do not want to go back and lose their lives. Look at, look at Jacob now, the father here, in verse 36. Jacob, their father, said to them, Me, have you bereaved of my children? Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away? All these things are against me. But that sounds like Jacob, doesn't it? We've heard Jacob say these kinds of things before, haven't we? When Simeon and Levi went and butchered all the men in Shechem, Jacob was only concerned for his own life there. Remember, oh, now the, the inhabitants are going to be against me. Now all these things are against me. And, um, well, Reuben steps up, and Reuben says, well, look, we, we need to take Benjamin. We need to go back, and, and I'll be responsible, and you can kill my own sons if it doesn't work out right. And, and Jacob says, absolutely not. You're not going back. Forget it. And that ends chapter 42, but in chapter 43, guess what? The famine gets very severe again. And, uh, well, I, I, there's kind of a comical little section here. I think we should read it. In verse 6, look at verse 6. Listen to this dialogue. You can't make this stuff up, by the way. Verse 6. Israel said, Wherefore dealt uh, ye so ill with me as to tell the man whether you had brethren? Okay, so the idea is, you know, this man in Egypt, he, he wants us to bring Benjamin with us. And Jacob says, Why on earth would you open your big mouths and tell that, tell that man you had a younger brother? Why would you even bother doing that? And uh, look at verse 7 now. And they said, the man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of, the, of these words. Could we certainly know that he would say, bring your brother down? Now, did we read that? Do you remember reading that? Did, did Joseph ask these questions? I don't remember reading it. They just got all nervous and just spilled everything. But now when their dad questions them, they're kind of like, well, you know, he asked us all these questions. We had to tell him. And, you know, how could we know that they would ask for Benjamin to come down? It looks to me like a total lie. You know, this is, 
th this is human behavior, right? I mean, you just don't make up stuff like this. But Judah steps up. Remember Judah? Judah started off not so good. I mean, pretty unscrupulous fellow, wasn't he? We read about the whole event there with Tamar. Remember that? Kind of distasteful, wasn't it? But uh, Judah steps up now, and Judah says, look, uh, I'll take responsibility for this. We need to go. We need to get food. We need to get uh, Simeon liberated, too, by the way. I mean, let's, let us go, Dad, and it's going to be okay. I will be responsible. And so they're released. Jacob says, go back. And they do. And when Joseph sees his younger brother, Benjamin, guess what? He weeps. He collapses. He, he leaves the room, and, and he cries. I mean, he, this man's heart is still soft to his family. It says in verse 30, Joseph made haste for his bowels, did yearn in him for his brother, and he sought where to weep. And he entered his chamber, and he wept there. And he washed his face and went out, and he refrained himself. And he, and he set on the bread. They're going to have dinner together. Joseph, still not recognized, he's going to have dinner with his brothers. They have no idea who they're having dinner with. But look what he does here. This is kind of interesting. Verse 33 and he sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, and the men marveled at one another. What, what's happening here? He is sitting these guys down. You sit here, you sit here, you sit there. And they're all arranged, oldest to the youngest. And his, his brothers are kind of wondering, about how on earth could this man know our relative ages? How could he know to arrange us like this? This is very mysterious. I mean, the whole, this whole situation is tense. Very, very mysterious. And he took and set the messes unto them. I love this old King James. Uh, set them before them. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as their, any of theirs. And they drunk and they were merry with him. And he sends them away. Now we've had dinner together. It's a wonderful time. Now here's your food. Go back to Canaan. But what did he do? He put his cup into Benjamin's sack. And along the way, Joseph overtakes them. He has them overtaken, and he says, one of you is a thief. Open your bags. And the cup is discovered. And it's a very tense situation. Now we have a thief among you. I mean, the whole thing's set up, isn't it? Benjamin's a thief. He's coming back. He's going to be prisoner. And who steps up? Judah. Judah steps in. I will be, I will be the guilty party here. You could treat me as the guilty one. Look at verse 14. Judah. Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him to the ground. Verse 16. And Judah said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also in whom the cup is found. Verse 18. Judah, again, has things to say. He says, let not thine anger burn against thy servant, for thou art even as Pharaoh. And Judah's really, as we read this, Judah is concerned. He's, you know he's concerned about? His dad. Uh, we just can't break our dad's heart again. And Judah steps in as the intercessor. He, and he's actually the, he's going to be the guarantee. He'll be the mediator. He'll be the substitute. Take me. Don't take Benjamin. I'll be the one uh, who'll take the guilt here. I love this uh, recognition here in verse 18. He says to Joseph, Thou art even as Pharaoh. He recognizes a very important Bible truth there. I mean, this, this is a shadow of Christ here. Psalm 2, right? Uh, serve the Lord, Yahweh. Serve Jehovah with fear. Kiss the Son. And we recognize, don't we, that Jesus Christ the Lord is the second member of the Trinity. He is every, much, every bit as much God as the Father. You're even as the Father, Jesus. Yes. We see a little shadow there with, with uh, Joseph. He is even as the Pharaoh. And so, uh, what happens? Well, uh, they're gonna, there's going to be an agreement here. And in fact, it's going to be a spectacular agreement that takes place right after Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Uh, let's look at the next chapter. Chapter 45. Let's look at a spectacular revelation here. Chapter 45. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all of them, and, 
at, that stood by him, and he cried. And he cried, Cause ev cause every man to go out from me. Get away from me. And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said unto his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father yet live? And his brothers could not answer him, for they were troubled. Uh, originally terrified. The word is terrified. And Joseph said uh, unto his brothers, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. A revelation. A spectacular revelation here. In, in Acts, the seventh chapter, we have Stephen's speech to the Jewish religious leaders. Acts 7, and he says, Joseph made himself known to his brothers the second time. What's he thinking about? He's thinking about this. When Jesus Christ came to his Jewish brethren the first time, they didn't know who it was. They did not recognize divinity. They did not recognize Messiah. But when, but when he comes a second time, they will recognize him. They will bend the knee to Jesus. They will recognize their Messiah. It says, every eye will see him, even those that pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. I'd like you to flip. Please turn ahead to Zechariah chapter 12. Go, go ahead to Zechariah chapter 12. It's almost the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah 12. You need to see this here. Because it speaks of Christ's revelation to, to his people at the end of days. Zechariah chapter 12. Do you have it there? This is speaking of Christ's revelation of himself the second time. Just like Joseph revealed himself the second time they visited. Verse 8. Take a look, please, verse 8. And the Lord shall, uh, sorry, verse 8. In that day shall the Lord defend his, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them, at, uh, he that is feeble among them, at that day shall be as David, and as the house of David uh, shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. Well, there we now we have it. The angel of the Lord is to be equated with God. We suspected that. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Who is talking here in these verses? It's God Almighty. He's talking. He's the one. But notice what he says here in verse 10. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. God himself pierced when? How? On the cross of Christ. Jesus Christ, the Lord God Almighty, pierced for our, our iniquities, Isaiah tells us. Remember that? A spectacular revelation to God's covenant people one day in the future, just like we have a revelation here uh, to, his, to Joseph's Jewish brethren. Look what it says in verse 5. Now therefore be not grieved. This is Joseph talking to his brothers. Don't be grieved, don't be angry with yourselves, for ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. Look at here, verse 6. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and, uh, ye, and yet there are five years in the which there shall be neither, uh, neither be earring or, or harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And so it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. And it just goes on several verses here. I encourage you to read them. But this is all about the sovereignty of God. These last verses here, up to verse 12, I mean, this is, this is Joseph telling his brothers, please, brothers, will you listen with both ears? This is really, really important. And by extension, we're supposed to listen with both ears. This universe is just not left on autopilot. Things are not just happening randomly around here, unpredictably. Uh, there's a plan and a purpose to this whole thing. Uh, when you're caught in the middle of it, it looks just so senseless sometimes. And you ask, your, you ask yourself, why? Beautiful children, lost, abducted, hurt, harmed. We were still looking for this, this lady, Mrs. Kroll, right? Why? Why is that? 
you just pick up the newspaper and just read about it. Why? Oh, God, why? And, and God is encouraging us to stop and just reflect a little bit. Why are you even framing this with the question, why? Why are you even doing that? If you really thought the place was random and accidental and meaningless, you'd never ask why in the first place. The reason why everybody asks why is because deep down, like the Bible tells us, we do know that there's a plan and purpose behind it all. And you might not figure it out why things are happening the way they are right now, and I might not figure it out. And you know what? We won't figure out a lot of it on this side of heaven. But Joseph says, please, listen. God has a plan and a purpose. He's working all things together for good. He let this happen so that lives would be spared. To save Israel. To save the Egyptians. And to make a fantastic object lesson for you. A future spiritual truths that will be life-saving. Spiritually life-saving. I hope we're getting, are we getting this. Look what he sees. I mean, Joseph is so bold. He actually says, it wasn't even you who brought me to Egypt. It was God. What do we call that? We call that weak actualization. There's a word for you you can take home. It was God that engineered the whole thing. And that's amazing. It says in verse 9 here, God has made me Lord over all Egypt. That reminds me of Acts chapter 2. When... Uh, Peter stands up and he says, let all the house of Israel know that this same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made Lord in Christ. Just like Joseph was elevated up. So has the Lord Jesus been elevated up to sit at the right hand of God the Father to now to make intercession for the saints. He's been given the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. You can do it now willingly, you can do it later unwillingly, but every, t every tongue will confess. something that I had mentioned earlier. What a promotion Joseph received. What a promotion you're going to receive. I'll, I want to end with this point, guys. As Christians, the world might look at you right now and see you as the lowest of the low. They really might, you know. You are the stupidest of the stupidest people ever. I mean, you actually believe that, the, that God created the world? You, you believe a six-day creation? You believe Adam and Eve and all that stuff and an apple on a tree? And you believe in a talking serpent and all this? You've got to be kidding and Paul recognized it, one of the most brilliant men the world has ever seen, the great apostle Paul, recognized it, that the message we preach to people is absolute stupidity to them. And God says, you want to know something? The foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom so-called of men. And Paul says, you know what, I just came from Athens where I dealt with the greatest philosophers the world has to offer right now, and I came to you, Corinthians, and I didn't want to know anything except Christ and him crucified. I did not come to you with words of wisdom, great swelling words or anything else. I came and I preached Christ and him crucified, and that was it. That's the wisdom of God. That's how the wisdom of God is displayed to men, right there in the cross of Christ. And if we will be faithful with that message, what a promotion you we're going to receive. And the Bible says we're going to judge angels. It tells us in Hebrews, the second chapter, God has not put into subjection the world to come to angels, but to us. When Christ came into the world, he didn't take upon himself the nature of angels, the Bible says, but unto, he took upon him the nature of Abraham. He became like us. He became a real human being. And Peter says, you Christians, you're, you've been made to become partakers, get this, of the divine nature. How do you like that? You want to talk about a promotion. You want to talk about an upgrade. That's the heritage of God's people too, you know. And you say, John, it sure doesn't feel like it right now. I know. We were working hard yesterday, and my back still hurts. And you forget things, and you make bad judgments, and your body aches sometimes, and, and, and there's confusion sometimes, and there's darkness sometimes, and God says, dear child, will you trust me? Will you learn the lesson that Joseph learned? That sometimes, you, even as a Christian, you're going to pass through difficult things that don't seem to make sense, but will you trust me that I've got this all under control? And I'm going to show you in the future how I worked it all together for good. Will you take that to your heart and will you put that in your mind and help you to see things all right? And ensure that your heart remains soft for God and soft for his word and for your fellow man? Will you do that? And that's, the, I mean, that's, that's just some of the spectacular messages we have from Joseph. 
And I wish we had time because I'd love to just look at all these wonderful things that are jam-packed into these wonderful texts here. But we need to, we need to close right now and we, we need to do like the Lord told us and we need to partake of the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to have a word of prayer here and, and we're going to pass out the elements, okay? Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this morning that we can be here. And uh, uh, Lord, help us. Help us through the difficult times. We ask you to help us to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It is so desperately needed in our lives, Lord. We ask you to pull our thoughts where they need to go. Pull our affections where they need to go. We ask especially, Lord, now in this holy time where we remember Christ's infinite sacrifice that he made for us, the broken body and the shed blood. Lord, now we want to uh, observe that. We want to do like you told us to do in remembrance of what you did for us, Lord Jesus. So help us now as we do this. May we do it sincerely, acknowledging our guilt, but rejoicing in the love of our Savior who ensured that grace would much more abound even though our sin abounded Thank you, Lord, that love covers a multitude of transgressions. Thank you that there is remission for sins in the shedding of blood. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your blood can save and does save to the uttermost. In the name of Christ the Lord, we pray it. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Pastor Gill, could you help me this morning?